Okay, great. So I guess we have a, uh, an hour. Um, I'll talk for about 15 minutes, I guess, uh, plus, um, and then we have some time for, for discussion. Um, so um, for those of you who don't know me, which is probably most of you, um, I'm a professor of computer science at Georgia Tech. Um, I've taught a couple of MOOCs, um, both in networking, uh, but on slightly different topics, and I'll talk about um, each of those experiences here. Um, I think um, this should be fairly controversial uh, because I have strong opinions, but I actually don't know what I'm talking about. Um, um, so away we go. Um, I speak from experience, uh, not, not from principle here. So um, in the past year, I've taught, uh, taught uh, two different MOOCs. I've taught both of them a couple times now. Um, one was a free uh, MOOC. Um, on a topic called software-defined networking. I'll, I'll explain to you in a minute what that is, um, just very briefly. Um, that course has something like, um, it's been taught twice. Each time it's been taught uh, to um, uh, about 50,000 students enrolled. Each time about uh, 4,000 plus students end up sort of completing all the assignments. Um, I'll talk more about the numbers in that uh, later. Um, the other uh, MOOC, that I'm going to put in quotes, uh, is uh, this Udacity uh, MOOC that, uh, that I've basically taught as part of the computer networking. Uh, well, it's a, it's a computer networking course as part of Georgia Tech's online master's program, which you may have read about it. Uh, it was like on A1 in the New York Times a while ago. Um, uh, so um, OK, so what I'm going to talk about is, is a little bit of my experience teaching both of these MOOCs. Um, the first one I found to be uh, the course everyone, very pleasant, very scalable, uh, very shoestring, lightweight, low budget, etc. And the second actually to be pretty much uh, anything but any of those. Um, some of the reasons there I think are implementation based. Some of them I think are, are potentially fundamental. And maybe that's what we'll spend you know, the rest of the hour talking about. OK, so I'm going to talk a little. Um, most of the time, I'm going to talk a, a, about um, sort of my ex Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience with both. So first of all, what is this first MOOC? And, and, and you know, I'm not going to belabor the technical details here. But um, the reason that I'm explaining to you a little bit about like technically what it's about is because it's important for, for like the rest of our discussion is that it's a very focused topic. Um, this is sort of like a, you know, um, second level graduate course topic. It's very niche. Um, it's sort of a hot topic right now. Um, it's also extremely hot in industry. Um, so as we look at the demographics of people taking the course, it's, it's kind of interesting as well. Um, so, uh, but it appeals to basically professionals, people who are like at Cisco who've been working as network operators for 20 years. And they're like, hey, what's this new thing? Let me go check it out. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a little more detail. But you know, for example, there were study groups of like, you know, 30 and 40 people from AT&T taking the course. You know, people in their 40s and 50s um, who are who are trying to um, figure out what the the, the latest new thing is. Um, I've had two offerings. Um, last summer I taught it. Uh, there was a six-week version. This was very much like I was almost I was like putting it together like just ahead of like offering it. Um, and then this this Summer, I basically filled in a lot of the gaps. Actually, this topic, unlike probably um, a lot of topics that we teach, is like a super moving target because it actually wasn't even a real topic like three or four years ago. And, and things that are basically um, going on now will end up in the course like in a year. So it's, it's a serious moving target. There's, there's no really good book even, for example. Um, who takes it? Um, as I mentioned, there are about 50,000 people who, who like hit the enroll button. But as we know, that, that means various things. Um, there's something like 10,000 people who like are actively watching videos on any given, in any given week. Uh, I'm sorry, active doing something. You know, anywhere between like one and 3,000 like watching all of the lectures. Um, something like 3,500 this year like watched, you know, you know, basically made their way through the whole course. And then um, something like 500 plus turn in programming assignments. Um, here, oops, I better keep this. Um, this year, um, there's something like maybe 800 who, who attempted all, there are like eight programming assignments, one a week. So it's pretty intensive. 
Um, and I'll talk, about, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that as well and how we made that scale. Um, but that's interesting here too because a lot of the people taking the course actually aren't used to programming. They're network operators, right? It's not computer scientists. So they're like, what's this Python thing? Like I've been doing Cisco for 20 years. Um, other demographics, so like um, uh, lots of people from the US uh, in this particular offering. Um, and then, you know, here's another, I thought this was sort of interesting too. A lot of them employed full time. So that's going to kind of come back as well in some of uh, when I talk about demographics and, and, and the differences in the experiences as well. Um, uh, okay, so you've probably seen this kind of thing. I don't need to get into that. This is, of course, what the students see. This is, if, if anyone has done anything on Coursera, this will look super familiar. If, if you've done something in similar platforms, probably looks familiar. But actually, having done something in Udacity, it's, if, if the only thing you've seen is Udacity, this probably looks foreign. And actually, that's why the slide is here. Um, basically, having a super lightweight mechanism for adding course content uh, th that, that I can use Right, as opposed to like a production staff, um, has proved to be highly, highly useful. Right? The ability for me to go in there like after something has been assigned and tweak a due date or tweak visibility or add something or fix a bug uh, without going through a staff uh, is, is, is immensely useful, useful. Or record a lecture at 3 in the morning um, in pajama bottoms. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so, so how has the course developed? So I'll contrast this with the other course as well. Um, you know, um, this was interesting to me as well, like um, course lesson plan with learning objectives. The first actually, so a lot of people here, I guess, are learning people. The first time I heard the term learning objective was when I taught a MOOC. I've been lecturing for like six or seven years uh, before that. I was like, what's a learning objective? Um, so one of the things, this is not what this talk is about, but one of the things I took away was, was that, oh, this MOOC thing is really interesting. Like even if it doesn't actually, you know, take off, which clearly um, it, it is. But it, it's, you know, aside, you know, putting aside all the hype, it's actually really um, changed the way I think about in-classroom teaching as well. So there's a whole other talk or discussion on that. Uh, because actually, uh, wow, administration's paying attention to it. Like, uh, that's interesting. Um, I, now I need to learn how to teach. Um, OK, so top-down design, right? Um, and then. Um, uh, so the production, so I'll talk a little bit about the production, and this is where things start to diverge in the two MOOCs, right? So, um, and in fact, this is where sort of I realized like um, I had a lot to learn, and I think also the people who were like designing uh, MOOCs uh, or telling people how to do them probably could stand to learn a few things too. So we started doing this like in a studio at Georgia Tech, like, you know, schedule studio time, blah, 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 blah. Um, this was just like totally intractable. Um, I actually found that a studio, so I've actually done like TV interviews, right? I've, which is its own weird thing, right? Like you sit in some newsroom and like you're talking to someone across, it's pretty disorienting. I found this to be like a thousand times more distracting because there's this dude like on the side, like in your peripheral, I, I just couldn't do it. Um, so, and there were like a lot of people watching, right? The studio time is limited. Um, I actually didn't like the post-production quality. I had very little control over it. And I guess coming back to the second course, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and I just found that as a faculty member, like, you know, a lot of people, you know, may, you know, teaching might be their first order of business, but for me, it's like my third order of business. So I needed to basically fit this in when I could fit it in. And this just like didn't work. So I quickly scrapped that and started using Camtasia, right? So now um, this was sort of um, uh, controversial. I think uh, the studio people at Georgia Tech, like I think actually um, that you know th they're trying to basically justify their employment because they're like, okay, well, you know, the quality of your videos is going to really suffer, like if you don't use the studio and blah blah blah. You must use it, and I agree. Like you know, the quality of my videos is probably worse um, than a production quality studio video. However, um, no one ever complained. Like. Of all the people watching the videos, no one said, boy, it's a little like buzzing in the background, or boy, you're, you're looking down at this time. It was, people were, were, you know, when they had comments on the videos, it was all about content, right? Um, so, and I just found this infinitely easier to do. Um, it takes a little getting used to, of course, and also, at least in my case, I did all of my own editing, uh, which, is, which is a plus and a minus. So, the minus, of course, is it just takes more time. The pluses, though, I found is that I'm more engaged in the content, like I'm more engaged in, in the course. And actually, I got quite fast at it. Like I got to the point where I could look at audio waveforms and just like cut, like figure out where I'd done a retake and cut it out. 
Um, this is sort of like basically, um, you know, uh, how the the rule of thumb that 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 it you know that it took from me, um, you know, in terms of like producing, you know, um, I think um, uh, one of the one of the biggest lessons I found is that like actually editing can be quite easy to do on your own. You can do it on a pretty pretty much a shoestring uh, you know shoestring operation. You don't need like a massive editing staff because often we're just speaking, right? And if you mess something up speaking, it's easy enough to do a retake, and cutting is probably like the easiest thing to edit. Um, so I got very, very fast. Actually, these, these numbers, I think, uh, like 10 to 15 minutes of lecture for like two hours of recording and editing, that was like when I did it the first time. I'm now down to like, I can do it in about an hour, like uh, uh, something of that time. So you get pretty good at it, but it actually also starts to be pretty fun. Um, um, because you're because you're creating something. Um, okay, so like, okay, this is basically the 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 sort of plan that I took in my production process. Um, um, probably don't need to like get into all of this now. Um, one of the things um, that that sort of as I sort of like took ownership over creation of the lecture content, I started to think about like new ways to 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 give lectures, and one of them actually was like on screen demos, right? So. Um, you know, this is one thing that I just never would have thought of, like in a studio setting. But I was like, oh, I'm doing like this Camtasia stuff. I'm doing a you know screen capture. I want to show something in code. Like I want to show a demo. Why don't I just do a screen capture of like what's on my laptop and just like you know basically splice that into the video? Turns out, you know, okay, maybe obvious. But as it turns out, like when I was wanting to do that with Udacity and the and the online masters, it just like was not the barriers were too high for that. The other thing that I, was, that I thought about doing was basically, well, why not, people talk about in MOOCs, like, oh, we'll just have like the expert on that topic, like give the course, and then we don't need to have physics 101 taught by 100 people, like we can just have the best person do it, right? Well, I thought, well, you know, there, who's to say that I'm the best person to teach this? Why don't I bring in some other people to actually talk? So I basically just started using Google On Air Hangouts to like bring in other people, like, and I basically was the, uh, um, you know, um, you know, basically just interviewing them like for for uh, questions and content, and I thought, um, I you know that was something that I just never would have thought of had I not like had total ownership over like the creation and production of the material, um, and then since then like lots and lots of people who are doing MOOCs and, and other things have just copied the idea, so I think the lessons like that I learned from this like first crack was you know. I didn't, you know, lots of money like was not needed in this case. Now, of course, if you count the cost of my time and the cost of like the TA time, so it's not free, um, although no one paid me to do it. Um, but, you know, my time certainly is worth something. Um, it's only, I guess you can say it's only free if your time has no value, right? Um, so, but, um, but you can do this on a pretty, on a pretty shoe, on a shoestring kind of uh, budget. I think the other thing too is, is that, um, um, one of the things that I found um, is that the MOOCs themselves are, are kind of asynchronous, right? Like the students can consume the content kind of like at their own pace, like at their own time. They don't have to like show up at a lecture at a certain time. And that's, in, you, know, the, you know, that provides some advantages for them. Now on the flip side, like, you know, as lecturers, we can benefit from the same thing. Like, you know, um, the fact that I can do the lecture when I'm feeling like in the zone and like wanting to basically record a lecture, um, you know, I should be able to take advantage of that. When I have to go into a studio to do that, it kind of like takes away, and I have to sit down for three, four hours and start recording lectures. It kind of takes away some of that, um, some of that being in the zone. Um, assignments, so like scaling, right? So I'm gonna talk now a little bit about other parts of the course and production. So scaling, um, and this is one thing again where things, when I draw some contrast at the end, um, uh, I think things basically uh, there's a lot there's a bit to learn here. So even the even the platform I would say like the the Coursera platform that we use um, for the SDN course um, is not super good at handling things that are not multiple choice. This is something I think I would love to see, and you know maybe there are other platforms that are better at this. Um, but you know things like oh well we wanted to have a short answer where you could have like any one of these three things would give you like points and they're like oh no problem just write this regular expression i've cut it off here but it's like you know 10 line regular expression it's like great i need to you know i need to you know to go review my programming languages to uh, to basically write the solutions to this quiz so um, basically what what ended up happening there is basically just simplify um, and i think um, 
<clears throat> you know, perhaps there are things like pedagogically, I think, where, you know, perhaps the students might be getting more if they had other ways to sort of fill in answers. One of the things that I found is that, like, uh, writing the explanations for different options, like, uh, has, has sort of helped plug that hole. Um, but, but certainly there's, there's, uh, there's the, you know, this is a corner that we've cut for scaling where uh, there's a trade-off. Um, the assignments actually are tricky, right? So this is a pretty, as I mentioned, a programming intensive course. We wanted to, to teach like concepts with hands-on. Um, and we wanted also people writing code. Um, the grading actually needs to be done like uh, on a f highly scalable fashion as well, right? So we can't be reading, we can't be running everyone's code or debugging it, right? So basically what we did is we designed all of the assignments to, um, to basically run in a particular execution environment and then we'd grade the output like based on regular expressions that we picked that the students didn't know. Um, so to give, yeah, to, to basically explain this a little bit more and this is actually something where I think um, in the second course I taught, we have really not figured out auto grading, and this is one of the huge impediments to scaling. Uh, but like one, one of the ways that we achieve this is basically make sure, <clears throat> well, encourage, or to the extent we can control it, ensure that people are running the same, pro the same operating environment. So the way that we've done this is we've built a virtual machine, right, with a common operating system, set of packages installed, blah, 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 and we say, download this virtual machine. Um, we have, to the extent possible, tried to keep it small because, as we know, like in certain countries, the cost of data uh, is, is prohibitive. So uh, we've tried to basically keep it small. Now, what we have found, uh, you know, another sort of, like we've tried to basically do this to limit our pain in terms of like scaling technical support and debugging. Um, what we've found is that people basically just do their own thing anyway, and a lot of times when you, the, because of the way that we've design, like designed the assignments to have people run things in this operating environment, spit out some output, send it to a grading server, right? There are things that actually are performance dependent, like, okay, we're running network performance between like two nodes in a, inside a virtual environment, and you know, <clears throat> it works in the environment that we've tested, but now someone basically has installed their own thing, and it doesn't work, and, um, you know, we basically get five questions into trying to help them out when we realize they're not running the course virtual machine, right? So this is one of the things that has basically helped us scale. Um, and to the extent that people um, follow directions, uh, we can continue scaling. Um, forums, I think, is another place where basically this was a huge surprise to me. I was like, God, how am I going to contribute, like, you know, uh, communicate with 10,000 students? Now this, I would say, can scale, okay? And then this is something where um, where basically um, this depends, I think, uh, the, the ability for, for, I mean, sort of the, uh, the ability for this to scale depends a bit on the demographics of the students and their motivation, right? This scales very well in the, in the free course of 50,000 students. It actually does scale at all in the four credit paid course of 200 students. Um, why? Well, in this course, in, in the sort of free course with the you know, uh, niche topic, I have um, highly motivated students there for their own enrichment, wanting to basically learn a highly specialized topic, not there for a degree or credit and not paying. Therefore, willing to put in the extra effort to grind through you know, things that you know, aren't you know, working the first time, willing to help other students out. Often by the time I, you know, I see a question, it's already been answered. Take that to the other, uh, to the other um, uh, operating environment where we have students who are basically taking a general purpose networking course, um, may not be interested in the topic, interested in a degree, but maybe not interested in networking, um, paying for it, therefore expecting interaction with course staff. Um, and I've, uh, this is basically a case where I did, the two experiences could not have been more wildly divergent. Like you'd never think that it'd be easier to manage a forum of 50,000 than a, a forum of 200, but in this case, um, it has been. Um, so basically, um, this is a little bit more on that, right? So why like assignments and, 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 some, of the, and, and some of these things can scale? Um, so one of the things is, is uh, you know, when I give something out to 50,000 people, or you know, in you know, people who are actually looking at it, four thousand, still a lot of people. Um, I don't actually know who's out there, right? 
Um, some of those people may be, uh, you know, highly famous or highly important people, and I don't, they're faceless, and there are a lot of them, right? So I do a lot of, you know, a lot more work on these assignments before I release them, mostly out of fear because I don't want to actually make a fool of myself when there's a mistake. Um, and if there's a mistake, instantly I get, you know, hundreds of people saying there's a mistake. Um, but more importantly than that, in this, in this first course, um, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the SDN course, there's self-selection, right? Everyone who's basically doing the assignments wants to be there, and I actually crank that up one more notch uh, in the second offering. I offered two tracks. I said, okay, um, basically there's a programming track and a non-programming track. If you want to do the programming track, you get the distinction certificate. Otherwise, you know, don't do the programming track. So even more, we have people who are basically, they just want to be there, um, and they often, as a result, fix things themselves, and they rewrite documentation. So I've actually had cases where, I mean, here's basically an example of like, there was one thing I left out of a video in terms of like setup, and someone was like, oh, you left this out. Like, here's a blog post on like, basically how to do this properly. I was like, thanks. I just rolled it into the course material, so now it's there. Um, one idea that basically now I'm gonna use, I'm gonna try to use the next time around um, that, I got, uh, that I got from someone else is take the best students here, and there are a lot of people who are basically motivated to be TAs, like community TAs. So I'm going to basically try that next time. It seems like based on the level of engagement of some of these students, that should work. Um, people liked it. OK, so uh, moving on. So the second MOOC, this is much shorter, actually, um, because I'm mainly just drawing contrasts. Um, so MOOC. Um, so there's something like 120 students in each offering uh, so far. Of, of I've taught this now twice. Um, I'm going to put taught like this as well um, uh, uh, for reasons that we can, we can discuss. But this is just like a, it's like night and day. Um, so the, in the abstract that I submitted, and this is supposed to be the technical track, right? There are actually, I found to be huge technical differences between the platforms uh, that actually kind of like affect uh, both delivery and pedagogy. Um, everything ranging from like, you know, is this going to scale to just my general level of engagement. Um, so let me just draw a few contrasts. So how is this course developed? Okay, similar, top-down planning, but actually um, they wanted scripts ahead of time, right? So as opposed to like, you know, me basically recording a video uh, or a set of videos a week ahead of time, posting a week at a time, it was like script out the entire course, like, you know, script out the entire 15 weeks ahead of time before you even head into the studio. Uh, which I found incredibly hard to do, and I, I think actually the other other folks shared my my uh, my my uh, frustration with that challenge. Um, now, okay, on the other course, right? It was basically me, um, a TA, basically TA, who was one of my PhD students who just basically wanted to learn the topic, who was who was helping out for free as well. Um, in this case, we had uh, several full-time staff members. So this is like mythical man month, right? Um, a course developer um, who was super useful, as it turns out. Um, then a video editor who was useful in the sense that I didn't have to edit my own videos. But that's a double-edged sword, I think, because all of a sudden I'm basically one step removed from creation of the content. And that's, 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 uh, that's created its own set of issues, which we can talk about. Um, then part-time people, right? Pay TAs, graders, et cetera, right? So no sort of investment in, in like auto grading and scaling up front. So now there's this sort of self-perpetuating thing where I would say everybody's happy, right? Because um, people you know, in, in some, well, everybody's reasonably happy because there's money coming in, right? People are getting paid. I'm getting paid. The TAs are getting paid. Um, and there's a, there's a machine uh, uh, full of people who are basically, um, you know, going through the motions, but making no effort to basically scale things up, right? So why do we need to kind of invest time in auto grading if we have paid TAs and graders? So there's just sort of like that stuff isn't, isn't happening. Um, the course was recorded in studio ahead of time with custom equipment, right? So this was, this was interesting. I probably, um, I recorded the whole course maybe in uh, uh, 10 or 15, like, you know, set, like sit down sessions of like, three to six hours each, right? And me scribbling on a tablet, having no idea what the, the final output would look like, because I would just basically scribble and then say, oh wait, I messed that up, and then sort of go through. And then some weeks later, I would kind of see what the, the final video looked like. And oftentimes I didn't like it, but it was like, 
I'm out of the zone. I, I'm like, and actually, I should say, a few times uh, there have been mistakes. And actually, I've got a, I've got a list. I've got like a document of, of things I need to go in and fix. In the sort of do-it-yourself mode, I've, I've fixed everything like often like, like in the same week that it's been offered because something gets posted in the forum. They're like, hey, there's a bug. I'm like, cool. I'll just pop open Camtasia, re-edit that, like throw on the same shirt if I need to, but like re-edit that, right? Put it up. And in this case, it's like, oh man, I got to go to the studio. Like, okay, I got to schedule the time. I'm not in town. Oh wait, I'm teaching. Like, okay, forget it. Like I've got it now. It's been six months and I've got like three or four like pretty minor bugs that just like, you know, haven't been fixed. Um, the other thing is like all the stuff that I found that was really interesting, like sort of like got me thinking about pedagogy, like, oh, on-screen demos, like that would be really interesting. Or, oh, like let's do some interviews with luminaries. Like it just be, the, the, sort of the mode of scribbling on a tablet um, in a studio, it just like, it, it doesn't lend itself to the same kind of delivery. And, and um, I think I'll come back to that point in, in like when I wrap up here. Um, and, and, and then, Initially, all the material was released at once. Um, I think there was something in the keynote about this as well. Like, I, I couldn't figure out what the verdict was. I'm not, in, I'm not a learning expert, but I, here's a place where I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm going to offer my opinion. This was a huge mistake as far as, I, as, far as I'm concerned. Like, and I'll, I'll talk about why in a minute. Um, in the Coursera course I did, I released stuff one week at a time. Much better. OK, so just some comparisons. Um, video delivery we've talked about. Grading we've talked about, right? Uh, the forums, like. Um, initially, the Coursera stuff, I used Homebrew. Like, I moved to Piazza. Actually, a lot of Coursera students complained at first because they're used to, you know, they take another Coursera course, and they're like, what's this Piazza thing? Um, but they got used to it. Um, and actually, they, they stopped complaining as soon as they realized that I was answering their questions. Um, um, the pacing I just mentioned, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the demographics, hugely different, right? Um, the cost. Um, Again, these are just sort of like, this is here just to be provocative. This is not like I didn't tabulate anything. I just sort of like, you know, um, back of the envelope, just thought about it. Um, hugely different in terms of like cost of production. I don't know. So now I'm just trying to be a little controversial in a, a couple closing slides, right? So um, substance trumps style, OK? Like when, when I said, OK, forget it with this studio. I'm just going to like do it all on Camtasia. You know, people were like, ah, huge mistake. Like, you know, videos are going to look crappy. Like, you know, people aren't going to like it when, you know, your bedroom is in the back or whatever. People actually don't seem to care as far as I can tell. Like, the main complaints I get are on, on, on content, like, or uh, to the extent that we get complaints. Like, it's more like things being unclear, or this or that, right? Um, uh, I think um, there are different modes that work for different um, types of material, right? So for some, like, a you know handwritten tablet might be the best delivery uh, mechanism. For others, you know maybe not. Um, but it seems that there are certain platforms that that sort of dictate the the, the mode of delivery, and I just don't think that's that's right. Um, okay, so another um, sort of point here. So this is in, this is provocative. By the way, my dean has seen my position statement as well. I thought he'd be, um, you know. I thought he'd be more upset than he was when I, when I, when I showed it to him. But um, I've sort of used it as an opportunity to offer some constructive feedback. So because like the, I think the, the, the vision, of course, is to, to sort of scale that degree. And my opinion there is that basically the way that it's currently um, running is, is not well suited to scaling, um, and particularly not well suited to quality scaling. I um, mean, some of those reasons are technical, and some of them are, are, may not be, right? So, one of the things that, that allows a MOOC to scale, I think, is community support, right? So that's one thing that I talked about, like the forums, like the assignments, like people who are engaged, like you know, helping each other out, like correcting mistakes in my content, adding stuff to my content. Um, not, I paid for this course, like where's my like TA office hour? Where's my like, you know, why isn't the you know professor responded and the my thing's been up two hours because I paid like X dollars for this course? Kind of like takes all the the bad parts of teaching and like injects them back in. Um, uh, and then I think basically, you know, there are various things that can kind of dilute the support, right? So I think students like when they pay and expect staff, you know, staff content, this sense of entitlement seems to really like dilute dilute this sort of spirit of support. 
um, students who are basically not interested in that, you know, in that content. Like, I think there are a lot of, like, it seems like everyone who's taking the SDN course I teach really wants to be there, right? If they're not, they just drop out. Um, the others may not care, actually. They may, they're just there for an online master's in CS and like, okay, I gotta take this networking thing. Hugely different. And then I think the other thing that I alluded to that I'll just briefly mention here is that this go at your own pace style. So when I offered the course, I've actually convinced them to change this, right? When I offered the online master's networking course the first time, they basically just opened the floodgates to all the material and you know, within two hours there were people like, oh, homework eight, like I don't understand like what's going on here. I'm like, what's happening here? Like, I mean, I've got TA, so now you've got this like perfect storm of like students who are paying, expecting like rapid feedback and engagement from a course staff who's now got to figure, like get their head into eight different assignments at once, just like didn't work at all. Um, so I think, um, you, you know, the, a lot of those things, some of them may be fundamental, some of them I think, you know, obviously that last one can be fixed and I, you know, I, 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 I did change that. Um, then I think there are other platform specific factors that prevent scaling and I think like important, you know, as I mentioned, it's sort of like the studio, the content creation type of things. The importance of like giving the instructor autonomy um, in creation and also visibility over what they're doing is really important. I would say that, um, you know, again, to kind of like be provocative here, I don't actually get paid to teach the Coursera course and the TAs don't either, right? I basically just did it because I was like, oh, MOOCs, hype, let's see what's going on. Like, I wanna sort of contribute to this dialogue with, with some experience. And then it turned out that it had a bunch of ancillary benefits like uh, to my own research and other things that I didn't expect. It's been a hugely positive experience. The other course actually, this one is lucrative for me. Like I actually make money teaching this course and I actually get much less joy out of it. So, um, so I think there's something to be learned there. Um, so just in conclusion and then to sort of open it up for discussion, to make these MOOCs scalable, they require community engagement, low barriers to creating content, and also like supporting a diversity of delivery modes to Matt, you know, that's suitable for delivering the material. And, and certainly not all platforms are, easy, uh, are, are equal. And I think the other thing that sort of I've realized is that, you know, there are all different flavors of MOOCs and a four credit MOOC, you know, as part of a degree program is just like vastly different, you know, than a, you know, free MOOC on a very highly specialized topic. Kind of obvious once you sort of state it, but just a lot of things came up there that I didn't expect and that I tried to share with you. So I guess we have like half an hour for discussion. So, thanks. Oh, the microphone, yeah. yeah. So I guess like this is being recorded, so I've been asked to uh, uh, tell people that and tell people to speak into the microphone. Yes. One thing we've found uh, on staff recording their, their own videos uh, that uh, I just wondered if you've met the same thing is that uh, it's often really good to go back and re-record your first one. Yeah. Because, yeah, you, no, I've, because I've, you improve so much after you've done a few. I've done that, actually. So... Um, uh, I mean, that's another thing too, is that like, um, you know, pluses and minuses with do it yourself. Sometimes the software like doesn't work, right? And I've actually recorded, I've recorded a take of a video only to have the software crash, right? Wouldn't happen in a studio, but um, then I'm forced to do it again. I'm like, oh, that was way better. Mm. So, um, and uh, what I haven't done, uh, but I plan to do either in the next offering or the offering after that is to re-record all the videos, actually. All um, right. So. Um, this has been great, by the way, and just uh, this is more of a comment than a question, but I've been to at least a couple of other sessions now where people have brought up repeatedly the idea of, well, is this going to be sustainable if faculty members aren't getting reasonably compensated for their time? Yeah. It would be very interesting for a lot of, you should find a way to tweet a version of what you said that, you know, on the one hand, here is this free course that was a lot of work, but it was fun. I didn't make any money, but it impacted my teaching and my research in positive ways I didn't anticipate, which by the way, amen, I say all the same things. Yeah. On the other hand, here's this quite lucrative course that I think your own words were, was a lot less joy yep. to be involved with. I don't know anybody who is in the profession that we're in for things other than joy or some approximation of it. Exactly. It's certainly not for money. Exactly. So it might be interesting for you to get that out there as, anyway, that's all. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, uh, I'll figure out a way to get that out there. Um, yeah. So 
so thanks. I thought this was quite helpful. I'm also a professor of computer science, and so I think and I'm hoping that other people sort of absorb some of the things that you said because there were some technical details in there that I think that were kind of important. But um, one thing I've sort of wondered when I've seen with these MOOC platforms is they sort of remind me of old online portals, right? I mean, they're trying to do a lot of things. Um, they're trying to do a lot of things that are done well by sort of point solutions in other places, right? So the bulletin board's a great example, right? I mean, Piazza runs a forum, right? I mean, Piazza has a few other dinky features where you can like upload your syllabus and stuff like that, right? But they're not pretending to be a MOOC. They're just running a forum, right? Yep. It's a pretty good forum. There are things about it I don't like, right? But I haven't tried using either Coursera or edX with these tools, but I, I'm sort of worried that, again, it's back to the sort of portal model, right, where there's this, like, one home page I'm going to go to, like Yahoo, and it's going to have all my email and weather and everything else. And yep. the Internet hasn't gone in that direction, right? I mean, we have specialized solutions yeah. for these things. We expect people to navigate sort between them. Sort of bring them. in, like, things from different places. Well, also right? for video, right? I mean, I, I have to say, I mean, I, I'm surprised... I get YouTube, really right? frustrated with yeah. my colleagues who can't get a video on YouTube, right? Yeah. I mean, this is something that a six-year-old with a smartphone can do, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we, have, we, we pretend, I mean, even here, right, like we need this, you know, $40,000 recording uh, rig and a professional sitting back there turning it around, you know, <laughs> in order to get a, get a, you know, and, you know, sorry about that, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I have a smartphone in my pocket that can solve this problem, right? So, and, and yeah, it's not going to be as high quality but there's also, I think, some evidence from other studies that the quality doesn't matter, right, exactly what you discovered, right? Yeah. I mean, the production values of the video aren't really what matters. Right? Yeah, I mean, my comment there isn't scientific. I'd love to see, like, uh, you know, like people who are here, like, do something uh, about that because, I mean, just in my, ex anecdotally, like, it just doesn't matter. Like, oh, okay, it's a little clipped right there or something. And, oh, it has? I, I Perfect. At least one paper learning at scale. That okay. On okay, yeah, I'd love to see that paper. Um, Hmm? What was their conclusion? That uh, once you get above a certain, th as long as the speaker is an interesting person and the video is intelligible, right. above that threshold, engagement does not seem to be a function of production quality. But again, think about you. Right. I mean, right. people watch all sorts of things. <laughs> Terrible little production values, but if there's a cat in it, right? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. I'll start putting cats in there. <laughs> <laughs> a little break in the middle of your lecture, and the yeah. cat jumps yeah. in the garbage. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to argue with you guys on that a little bit. So I'm the creative director for innovative education at University of South Florida, and basically I run the video multimedia group who mm -hmm. does all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think I don't think it's about platforms not being equal. I think mm -hmm. speaking from a video perspective, if your goal is to do exactly what you're doing, yeah. certainly a video team can work with you and say instead of coming into the studio and making you work off of a tablet, maybe we can come into your office and shoot it and maybe have a little bit higher quality yep. and offer you opportunities that you don't have when you're shooting it yourself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it would be awesome splice in some interviews that you have with people. Yeah. Use the equipment that your video team has to yep. be able to do that. Yeah. I think that's, that's certainly, like, it kind of goes in line a little bit with what I'm saying, which is, like, you, basically what you're saying is, like, work with the instructor, right, to kind of, like, work within their mode. Right. I think what it sort of breaks down is it's like you must come here and like work within our mode, and I'm like, no, this is just is not happening, you know. Yeah, so. and our goal is to support instructors. Yeah. So instead of you having to edit all that stuff or retake and redo all that stuff, if you had a service that could do that, that was assisting you, mm -hmm. then maybe that would be better. Yeah, and that would be a service. Let me ask: If every faculty member at your institution was recording all of their lectures, there's no way you guys would be able to provide that service, right? And that's, like, we get that, right? I mean, it's, and this is what faculty will say. Is they say, well, I, I tried to videotape my class, but I contacted them, and they're all busy, right? And they can't send their dedicated rig, and get this stuff expensive, right? I'm saying there's cheaper solutions, right, that they scale better. We're talking about scalability. You know, maybe that's a place to start. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was sort of one thing that kind of, like, got me off into the just uh, the do-it-yourself mode is, like, the studio time was booked, right? And, and this was even, like, Two years ago, when people were like, "What? What's, what are MOOCs?" You know, um, and even then, I couldn't get studio time. So, yeah, it was at that point where I was like, "Okay, I'm just gonna like do it myself." So, yeah, there are certain things where the scaling uh, does definitely come into play. The I, I just want to agree with what you just said that there is no tyranny of the media team. Uh, I think the most of the teams that I know are very, very accommodating. And if you as a faculty member want to do it on your own, 
go ahead and do it on your own. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think there are a number of best practices that you can get from the media team that would help your Camtasia be even yeah, better. I think so um, too. But I, I think we're creating a, a statement that, uh, I don't know, maybe that's the case at Georgia Tech, that you have to do things a certain way, but I, I don't, uh, that seems to be the exception rather than the rule. I think most media teams are very accommodating as to how you want to do things and provide more consulting than, than anything if necessary. I think the consulting services that you mentioned would be, would be highly valuable. I mean, like to your point in the back, like that, you know, there's, there's certainly a lot of interest in terms of like this sort of do it yourself mode, but, but also like, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, you know, it took me a while to figure out like how to even look at the camera and like, you know, have people say like, you know, stop telling me I look stoned because I was like looking down like, you know, during an interview, right? So yeah, I mean like just these basic things. And I did have someone like from that office like watch some of my, you know, some of my initial videos. But yeah, you're completely right. I mean, you know, something that could scale is a consulting service to help people like to be better at production. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, so I mean, I, I don't think, if I heard your talk correctly, I don't think that I don't think I heard you saying that uh, that it's not a good idea to have production and videography and whatever teams around and available I to help. That, yeah. I think what I heard you say is the way that the organization of the production went does not match the way that faculty typically put together their courses, where there's some amount of just-in-timeism and there's adjusting after the yeah. fact. And, yeah. and, and we had the, a very similar experience. A thing that has worked pretty well at Berkeley is uh, for faculty who have not done this before, the first time they do one of these courses, they will go in with the, the production and videography team for like their first couple of recording sessions. They'll get a lot of pointers, how to do things, how not to do things, the kind of stuff you're talking about. And then after that, typically they'll say, thank you, I get it. Mm -hmm. I will now record, and because we have a couple of little studios set up that are essentially self-service. Yeah. We can still take advantage of the production team for doing edits or things that are more complicated, but after they've gotten the hang of it with professional coaching, they're in a much better place. And they actually don't want to be in a studio with somebody hanging over them the whole time. What they want is to do it on their own time as the course goes along. So I think there is a happy medium, and I think there's yeah. a great use of that resource. But what I think I heard you say was this, you know, let's do everything up front with a script, and now we're done. That's, it's difficult for faculty to get used to preparing a course that way. Yeah, I don't even, think it's, I don't even do. think it's like possible to do it in as high quality if you're doing it that way. You said that, not me. But, yeah, but I think yeah. I, I think you're talking about the process more than the absolutely. the actual absolutely. team or equipment or anything like that. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, also, audio uh, microphones. You know, the near field uh, headset uh, microphones. Now you can use them pretty much anywhere except with a dump truck <laughs> unloading <laughs> next to you, and you get absolutely fantastic audio, mm -hmm. even with background noises and so forth. So. Um, and the resolution of your Camtasia uh, screen capture videos is exactly the same as what you get in the studio. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's no mm -hmm. difference. Yeah. So. I think you've had your hand up for quite a while, yeah. But. What I also wonder about is how useful video is at all. Everyone says, oh, we have to have video, we have to have video, but some of that's an artifact just from the era of the monasteries when we <laughs> stood up in front of the, all the other abbots and read out the Bible. Yeah. Uh, but the transferable skill for students is probably reading books. Yeah. Yeah. There's thousands or hundreds of thousands of more books than sets of videos. And I think we de-emphasize that a lot in the MOOC teaching because we're just trying to transfer a regular course onto a MOOC. And we actually have a chance now to change how we teach. Yeah. The mode is very interesting. Like, and I, I, don't, I haven't quite figured it out myself, right? Because like, in the classroom, I don't use slides. Like I use, you know, I just use the board and I lecture off notes. And, I'm, and then I was like doing this MOOC and I'm like slides, like what's this? This is not going to be great. Um, and it, it was fine. And then in the other course when I was basically scribbling on a tablet, I was like, well, this this should be better because it's kind of like whiteboard, right? And it sucks actually. It's like, you know, it's all messy. I don't like. It's like really <laughs> doesn't look good. And then when when they're like, ah, oh, it's like a little close to the margin. Can you redo this? And I'm like, no, I'm not going to redo 45 minutes of me like scribbling out proofs. Like because it's two inches like too close to the margin. So, but why yeah. not put proofs in a book and have yeah, them read a book? Right? I mean, yeah. I mean, so, this is crazy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess like I so, mean, t I, I, oh, yeah. But before we get off on that tangent, like I, I guess the point I was trying to make was like the way that I was delivering stuff by video was like to like I thought basically slides would not be you know 
of course writing's better because that seems to work better in the classroom. And for me, it was exactly the opposite. So anyway. Yeah, uh, no, I just want to say there, there's a difference between presenting, a proof is a great example, but it's like a program or anything else, as a fait accompli. And in a book, it's a fait accompli and it's right there. And there's something fundamentally different about the thought process of going through it and articulating the process and revealing, you know, I, let me say, I'm not yeah, arguing for revealing, but, but you're not, you, it's not dead silence and I'm now just writing it. What happens is I'm writing it and I'm talking to you and there's, there's this implicit message of where the hard parts are that gets sort of conveyed by your body language and your timing and everything else. See the whole truth, right? And I want that. I want to see it step by step. Right? You can write that out in the book too. You can say, well, here's this overall structure. Here's the hard parts. Here's the, okay. Now we managed to do this part. Here's what we still have left. Well, the this is an interesting control. point. Like, so time after. there is because we need it. This is an interesting point. Like, the, I mean, uh, <clears throat> you know, in my editing, of course, like I edit out things, you know, where I, where I have to stop and think. Right or I if I, like of course mistakes I'll edit out right so like those things get edited out so there is like the video is sort of somewhere in between the book and the live it's lecture. Really interesting to actually if you're doing this at a free MOOC to actually run an A/B test. My my hypothesis, which I would love to see you test, is that it is actually better to reveal the stopping and thinking and the mis even not all the like stupid mistakes no but but the ones that, that they're likely to make. Yeah. Actually, exposing to the my own students report that you know when that happens, that's actually incredibly useful. Yeah. One of the things I did, like I, it would be interesting to put it into the videos. But one of the things I did was like when I did one of the programming assignments, I actually made some mistakes. And in the quizzes, basically, I I basically put my buggy code, and I was like, okay, here's a mistake I made. Like, what's wrong with this? So it's it's not quite the same, but it's, it's exactly the right idea. yeah. I just want to say one of the, uh, I'm Beth from edX, um, one a professor shared with me sort of a, something that was a bit of a revelation, maybe shouldn't have been, about why he uses videos and what the intention is for him and how he feels about them um, and, and why he doesn't mind having low production value. He said, I don't think of the video as anything that replicates any other teaching moment that I have where I'm addressing an entire classroom full of students. What I think of the video as is my near approximation of what it's like to have a student sitting next to me at my shoulder asking me questions about mm. a topic. So for him, the, the teaching moment is on that sort of one-to-one. -one. And, and he thinks of it as like the only I mean, one of the true advantages of MOOCs is that you can sort of treat that like your opportunity to have that possible moment with thousands of people mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. just the 10 that can make office hours with you. Yeah. And so when he thought of it that way, when he sort of changed his mental state from thinking it was a replacement for the lecture, <coughs> a replacement for the book, or something like that, or a redaction section, as a yeah. moment to have that one-to-one -one, yeah. you know, opportunity it's an interesting with his thing. students, then he really changed his thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I mean, you were saying, like, why do we need videos? And, and like, actually, it, it, it's another thing I'd be curious. I don't have, again, any, like, sort of scientific data about this. But, like, in the Coursera course, there is, like, a headshot of me, like, speaking on the slides, you know, like many MOOCs. And the other one is basically a hand. And, like, one of the things, uh, he's scribbling, right? So one of the things people have said to me who've taken the Coursera course, some of them I've, like, you know, chatted to on the phone later, met in person, and they're like, boy, I feel like I know you already. <laughs> you know, and they're like, I get that a lot. Um, but no one's ever said that to me, like, in the other court. And I don't know if it's just, like, there's obviously not a controlled experiment there, but it's, <laughs> yeah, nice hand. <laughs> hey, you're married, huh? <laughs> can see the wedding ring. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, remarks. Uh, I'm Willem van Valkenburg of uh, Delft University of Technology. Um, the first uh, thing is that, um, uh, no, I forgot my point. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, uh, what, what I noticed in your story is, is that um, you hardly got any support from your institution, and, and they're doing more MOOCs and more things, so I've, I would have thought that you would share that, they would share that experience and know a little bit what, what can help you, and uh, that surprises me. 
Um, and I, I can understand that uh, you want to do more yourself, but that's uh, that, that's the way to organize it. Uh, at least for us, we say we de we uh, you do it yourself, we do it with you, or uh, we do it for you. And you can choose uh, what you want. Mm -hmm. uh, we are the, there for the teachers to help them, and it's their choice on how to do that. So you can do everything in the studio, or you, we give you a camera and you do it yourself. Um, the other thing, uh, what we notice is that um, we try to convince teachers that they spend more time in the preparation of, the, of making the video uh, instead of doing a lot of post-production. With the preparation before the video take, you uh, increase the quality. With post-production, you can never increase the quality of the video. Um, so spending more time in the preparation uh, really increases uh, the video. And I know that is very hard for teachers that instead of um, record, uh, preparing their lectures the, the night before they have lecture, they now have to do that more in advance and that's something they have to get used to. But eventually uh, what we noticed is that it really improves the quality and that they will notice that. And they now use the videos also for their regular classes and uh, not only for the MOOCs. So one thing that's interesting is uh, if you go to a good lecture in a large classroom, there's a certain amount of energy that, that you get from the students and, and, and it gets reflected back uh, uh, by the faculty and, and, and that. And even the MOOCs that have used large recorded uh, uh, lectures uh, uh, basically in a classroom, you see when you look at that there's this certain set of energy. How do you keep that energy in when you're recording by yourself in your bedroom? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Red Bull? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess. Do, do you feel like I, there's a difference? I mean, like if you're in front of hundred students teaching, I don't know. If, I don't know if I don't know if that's the right question. Like, uh, I mean, like, I mean, I guess coming back to the comment that was made before, like, maybe, maybe recreating that energy of a lecture hall isn't isn't going to happen in the video. Maybe it's not supposed to. One of the things I see is like there's energy in the forums or there's yes. not energy yes. in the forums, right? Yes. So yes. I do make a concerted effort in the forums to stay, and that's where I think the platforms and your point about like, uh, the, the earlier point about like, why are people rolling their own forums? Because like people kind of like know how to do good. I mean, I couldn't actually keep the energy high in the Coursera forums, but like using Piazza, it was much easier because it was like, okay, I mean, many of us in here have used Piazza, so we know like it doesn't take that much to go in there, babysit it, like, give it a few shots in the arm and actually like there's a lot going on. So I think, yeah, the energy in the videos, I don't know, maybe people, some people have cats and other things, but like <laughs> I, I don't actually try. I don't try to keep the energy high in the videos, but the forms I actually, where things are not in the videos, I try to basically put more energy into the forums and I think it's possible to do it there. I just wanted to make a quick follow up. So I think it's a really personal thing about the energy. I have a colleague who is so engaging on film. She is unbelievable. You are convinced she is speaking to you and only you when you watch these videos. She's, she's incredible. And so I think you can keep that energy up, but I think it's a really personal thing. Like I've right. seen her videos and been absolutely astonished. Um, and she is, you know, an incredibly distinguished person, but she doesn't take herself too seriously. So she added a video where she says, we're going to now do a stretching break. And so this, you know, distinguished Harvard Business School professor gets up and leads their students through stretches in the middle of her MOOC. She's yeah. unbelievable. So I think you can do it, but it's a real skill. Yeah. Um, I do not have the skill. Yeah, that seems like a, a, a super specialized skill. And uh, yeah, I would say for me, like, I mean, and this is another thing where, like, in the in the SDN course, like because it's such a niche topic and something where it's like actually pretty close to my research, I'm super interested in it myself. So it's not hard for me to like fake energy, and a lot of times, a lot of times I'm like actually learning it, as you know, not quite as I give the lecture, right? Obviously, but like, you know, almost in conjunction conjunction with teaching the course. So like I'm very much into it myself. Whereas I think if you're just sort of like lecturing on a general networking topic, and be maybe we need stretching breaks actually. <laughs> 
Um, so I'm a sociologist, but I came into this talk sort of expecting, as I, as I understand, expecting a more technical discussion of the differences between the platforms. Uh, but when I came, and when your story was very interesting, but as I, as I listened to it, I realized that it could be sort of what you're describing is a set of institutional issues that you ran into mm -hmm. in Coursera and in Udacity, mm -hmm. and both mm -hmm. of sort of, I mean, if I was an economist, I would say you had two different incentives, but I won't yeah, use it because I'm not too. an yeah. economist. Yeah. But uh, I was wondering, the one part where you said you ha where I could see a sort of technical issue was in your auto graders. So I was wondering, if your difficulty in not being able to make an autograder for the Udacity class your, was, was an institutional issue in the sense that you did not have the labor to make it, or was it a technical issue in the sense that it was difficult for you to do it? Both. I think basically it's, and could it, you start, explain? it starts off as a technical st starts off as a technical issue. Oh, there's no auto grading servers to basic. You know, oh, we can't submit like output and have them basically graded at scale. But wasn't okay, it there? Do that with scripts. But then basically, what we get into is like, okay, we don't design the assignments so that they they can be auto graded. Now we get into a self perpetuating thing. It becomes institutionalized, which is like we have a ton of assignments can't be auto graded. Now we've got paid TAs, right? So this gets into the whole like institution thing. It's like people are kind of like getting fat off the. You know the online masters, like people getting no incentive to basically streamline it, right? Like publishers, like, publishers. like government. I, I don't I, I mean, understand. It's like, there's no incentive to streamline it, so I, I it's, don't it started quite off technical, but like quickly becomes institutional. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I understand it because I've, I've experienced those. Yeah. Okay. The, the the most pronounced immediate effect after putting together all the MOOC materials is that the injection of those materials back into the campus class, especially all of the auto grading and automation and streamlining and the virtual machine, had such an amazingly positive effect on the campus class yes, yeah. that it changed the way we think about fixing the campus class. We no longer do something for the campus class that cannot be scaled. The only exception to that is that we have this very uh, instructor intensive group project that is an essential part of the campus class, and by the way, is totally absent in the MOOC version. Yeah. But what it means for the campus is the TAs can spend roughly 100% of their time on that yeah. instead of all of the things that have been automated away. Yeah, it's changed like, the way that we yeah. think about developing course materials, f and definitely for the better. Yeah, because the students don't learn that much synthesis from doing the homework. They get basic skill building. The synthesis is learned from doing open-ended projects. That's the hard part, yeah. right? We haven't figured out any good way to scale that with, with you know, fewer instructors than we have. So instead, we're trying to scale everything else so that we can devote more, relatively more resources to that piece. And that's a conversion that I did not expect, yeah. but it's made, it's like night and day. Yeah, this is huge. I mean, like, we're, we're I mean, I'm. No, I'm, I'm, I'm completely on the same wavelength here with Armando as far as like when we made the auto grading work for the Coursera course, it, it's exactly what he's saying. Like basically I teach that course on campus and one of the things that like when you teach it to tens of thousands of people, you streamline stuff and you operationalize things and you figure out how to automate things that can, that can be automated, right? And you get organized. And that level of streamlining and organization leaves you time to basically do other things. Like the TAs are basically, oh, they're actually teaching because they're not spending Grading all this time. time like, you know, doing technical support for someone who's basically installed something on a version of Ubuntu that's like three years old. It's like, no, all that stuff is gone and they can instead like basically focus on the stuff that, you know, that hopefully matters more. So 